Jacqueline Shirk is a 10-year veteran master gardener with Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. She has a diploma in horticulture technology from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Before moving to the island, Jacqueline operated a landscaping business in the lower mainland for 12 years. She has two national industry certifications from the Canadian Nursery and Landscape Association. She has one diploma in softscape installation and another in ornamental maintenance. Jacqueline is also a certified arborist. She is a member of the International Society of Arboriculture for the past 10 years, and she has an additional accreditation in tree risk assessment. So amazing credentials from Jacqueline today. We're so lucky to have her and welcome Jacqueline. Thank you very much, Kendra. Uh, greetings everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jacqueline Shirk, your Master Gardener host for this session. Just before we get started, I have an important slide to make note of regarding the content of this presentation. I'm sure you're already reading ahead here, so I'll just state that my presentation is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Master Gardener Association, and it's intended for educational purposes only. No part of it can be used without prior written consent. Also, you can see in the third paragraph some information about the Master Gardener Association. Most importantly, that we're an organization of trained volunteers and that we teach and promote only science-based and sustainable horticultural knowledge. I'd like to introduce you to the Invasive Species Councils of BC. This slide shows a map of our regional area, which is the Coastal Invasive Species Council. It encompasses all of Vancouver Island and extends across the strait to include parts of the Sunshine Coast and areas north of it that are adjacent to Vancouver Island. There are a total of 17 regional weed committees throughout our province, encompassing nine regional districts, 34 municipalities, and 57 First Nation groups. The stated mission of the Invasive Species Council is to take a leadership role in reducing the negative impacts of invasive alien species through outreach and education, collaboration with partners, providing advice and services to manage invasive species, and seeking support to achieve a vision of healthy landscapes and communities free of invasive species. What we'll be looking at today is plant strategies, their methods of reproduction. Since the goal of a plant is to reproduce, and since they can't actually get up and move around, they have evolved with strategies. We'll talk about this more. Identification, of course, is what a plant looks like. What are its attributes, including leaf, flower, and fruit forms, colors, the size, anything else that sets them apart and makes them recognizable. What are the impacts of invasive plants? Well, through competition for water and nutrients and space, invasive plants displace native plants and other desirable vegetation, disrupting natural ecosystems. Invasive plants can affect soil productivity, water quality, aquatic habitats, stream bank stability, biodiversity, and wildlife habitat. According to the Invasive Species Council, Invasive plants are the second greatest threat to biodiversity after habitat loss. And as a result, native plants most often, <clears throat> excuse me, lose the battle overwhelmed by aggressive alien invaders. Habitat is where they prosper. Is it full sun? Is it wet or dry or other combinations? Some plants need fertile soil. Others will grow in gravel. It all depends where they evolved. And keep in mind that often what makes many invasive plants invasive is their generalist ability. That is, the ability to tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. How did they get here in the first place? Was a plant brought here intentionally or did it arrive by accident? Intentional is often the sad fact. Many exotic plants were innocently introduced as ornamentals and unintentional is just as common. Plant parts and seeds arrive in ship ballasts or attached to boat hulls. Others have arrived via aircraft food imports, and in so many other ways. The invasive plant that you have in your garden might have got there by growing under the fence or over the fence or by a past property owner or a friend of theirs offering a free plant. Again, so many ways. 
Controls and prevention. Simply put, what can be done to stop a particular plant from spreading? How can we avoid being part of the problem with this plant? Some plant families have many bad apples, but some might just have one bad actor, while others in the plant family are well-behaved and garden worthy. And note also that any particular plant might only become invasive in certain areas. Grow Me Instead is an initiative of the Invasive Species Council that offers recommendations of non-invasive plants that can be used to replace invasives that we may have growing in our landscapes. I've included some Grow Me Insteads for various landscape situations toward the end of our hour here. If we don't have time for it and you have the recording, you'll still be able to see these recommendations. Plus on your handout, you'll see that there is quite a bit of information. Just give me a moment here. Is it weedy, invasive, or noxious? Do these terms mean the same thing or something different? Have you heard the expression that a weed is just a plant growing where you don't want it? Well, that might be true for the ubiquitous dandelion, a lawn weed we're all familiar with. Here also is Centauria, also known as bachelor buttons. Both of these plants are non-native and considered as invasive. Both are very good at getting their seed around. The definition of invasive is a plant or animal living outside of its natural habitat. That is, it's a non-native. It's also one that displays rapid or aggressive growth. It has the ability to reproduce quickly, absence of natural predators, and negatively impacts the environment. Noxious is a term, moment here, used for a plant that is considered to be harmful to crops or livestock or the environment and therefore the economy. They are usually invasive alien plant species that are regulated under law. Here's knotweed in this picture that I just clicked to show you. An example of how knotweed is harmful to fish. It proliferates in riparian areas and destroys habitat, producing food for fish and marine species. Then the fish starve if the plants they depend on to produce insect life that is their food end up dying out due to knotweed taking over. Reproduction is survival of the species. All species need to reproduce in order to survive and plants are no different. So plants have evolved strategies to get their progeny out into the world. Two means of reproduction, seed dispersal and vegetative growth. Let's look at seed dispersal. Here we have the wind dispersing the dandelion seed. The wind also disperses the Samara seed, which is the seed of the maple or the ash tree. Um, water, there goes the coconut, it's already growing. Animals, birds eat fruit and poop out the seeds. Squirrels move all kinds of things around. And here's a dog covered in burrs. Plants can also reproduce via vegetative means. And in this slide, we'll look at stolons in the top left corner, just like your strawberry plant. What about layering? Have you ever noticed your hydrangea plant roots down where it touches the ground? Lots of plants do that. Suckers, like your lilac does. Here's a pic on the right that has the picture of the lilac. And then there's this picture of rhizomes. Rhizomes are very interesting. They're not roots. They're actually modified stems. This is a picture of bamboo, which is a rhizomatous plant. So note that they are not actually roots. These, well, you can see the roots, they're growing off the nodes, but the bottom there, that, that horizontal thing you might think is a root is actually a stem. So stems have growing points called nodes where above ground leaves would emerge from. But as you can see on this bamboo, growing on this, on this slide. If it's underground and it has nodes, it's a rhizome, not a root. We'll be seeing a lot of rhizomatous plants because they're very successful at reproducing. So here's the plants we'll be looking at today. Two thugs we're all familiar with, Himalayan blackberry and English ivy. Two we love in spite of themselves, English holly and butterfly bush. Here's one I call Bad Daphne. There's the ever troublesome periwinkle, <clears throat> lamium, goutweed, St. John's wort, and the chameleon plant. The lovely pond plant, yellow flag iris. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two more of great concern, 
is the knotweed and one called policeman's helmet. So we're gonna start by looking at Himalayan blackberry. Everybody's familiar with that. The leaf form, three to five distinct leaflets, they're toothed, usually oval, distinguished from other blackberry species by the whitish color on the back of its leaf. Do you see that in the inset here on the, on the right side? Blackberry, Himalayan blackberry has robust stems or canes, often an inch or more in diameter with very large thorns, small white flowers in early July with large tasty back fruits in August. Now we have several native blackberries as well. Rubus ursinus, called the trailing blackberry, is one of them. It's the very low growing one that often trips you when you're on a forest walk. The habitat for blackberry is almost any sunny location, especially disturbed sites, roadside ditches, pastures, forest edges. Blackberry prefers rich soils and full sun, but can survive and thrive in almost any soil type and light conditions, except deep shade. Himalayan blackberry is what we call a generalist. It reproduces both by seed and vegetatively. It actually roots at its stem tips. That's a growth point. And you've probably seen how it can leapfrog its way around. And I wish I could have found a picture of that, but um, I think you know what I'm talking about. This must be the only reason blackberry is forgiven for its unattractiveness and aggressive behavior. It has delicious berries. Even Bernie Dinter of Dinter Nursery says so, but I know he's not selling Himalayan blackberry. Here's why it's such a problem. It grows extremely aggressively, outcompeting native vegetation. It causes environmental and economic impacts as it swiftly claims large impenetrable thickets up to three meters high, including riparian areas. Thickets can produce up to 13,000 seeds per square meter, and the seeds are viable in the soil for years and years. The fruit is eaten and spread by mammals and birds, and even stem fragments can regenerate. Don't make allowances for Himalayan blackberry to grow on your property just because the berries taste good. Note that there's less of it in the winter when it's not actively growing, so that's a good time to make progress against it with loppers or a brush cutter. Management will take over three to five years and consistent effort of cutting it back and not allowing it to grow until its root reserves are exhausted. Then the crowns can be dug up and removed fairly easily once canes are removed. But you can be sure that re-sprouting will still occur and you will have an ongoing problem to get rid of blackberry once and for all. And I should just mention here that fact sheets are available online at the Invasive Species Council for most of their in the plants that they have listed as invasive. You can get a lot of good information from these fact sheets. And also I should mention that you can visit your local nursery for non-invasive blackberry varieties. Let's look at the next plant here, which is gonna be English ivy. That's a real bug to do. Heterohelix has um, two distinctive leaf forms. I'm not sure if people are uh, readily aware of this, but on the left here, you see the juvenile leaf form. Um, it has three lobed leaves. Now look at the picture of it in the top right corner. This is the adult or reproductive form. It has diamond shaped leaves. And when hetera can grow upright, it can flower. It can't flower when it's prostrate. But when it gets to flower, it produces these clusters of small white flowers that you see here. And they develop into purple or black berries by late summer or fall. So in this form, it can successfully propagate itself by seed. Picture here on the bottom left is showing you how it roots at the nodes. <clears throat> I'm sorry, bottom left. It, this is the picture that shows you the leaf forms of various cultivars of heterohelix. There are many. When ivy climbs, it, it uses these aerial roots shown in the center picture. It isn't a twining vine such as morning glory is or clematis. Instead, it uses these aerial roots that attach very well to just about anything fences, houses, trees. Another climbing plant that you might know that uses aerial roots, I thought I would mention, is your climbing hydrangea, which is a lovely plant. But since ivy doesn't always get to climb, it has another strategy, and that is that it roots at its nodes along the stem. So if you can see this picture in the bottom left, at every place where a leaf could emerge, roots can also emerge. 
changing slides here. There we go. Um, habitat, it thrives in any soil, grows in sun and is very shade tolerant. It prefers a moist open habitat. Commonly planted or re resorted to to provide quick cover, especially on the ground. English ivy is recognized as a serious and harmful invasive in Southwest BC. It shades and smothers other plants forming ivy deserts on the ground. There's a picture of an ivy desert here. It also matures very quickly once it gets vertical, producing copious amounts of seeds that are eaten by birds and dispersed into woodlands. Ivy deserts overwhelm plants on the forest floor and prevent native seedlings, including conifer seedlings, from growing by its shading and smothering. And it can debilitate and even kill trees. I don't know if people are aware of how much, how much weight is added by ivy growing on the tree. And it actually prevents the tree from photosynthesizing. So it's a very dangerous plant growing up a tree. <clears throat> and if you, if, if you cut the stems just even at your, at your chest height, you can stop the ivy from growing. You don't have to pull it out, just, just cut it. Just stop it from being able to grow any longer. And as it dries out, it will eventually actually fall out of the tree or be easily pulled out of the tree. The Invasive Species Council advises that all hedrohelic hedra species are potentially invasive and especially to not let it grow vertically. Um, I should also mention that you should not compost it. Uh, you should dry it out. And I, I, oh, excuse me, I was gonna show you this picture here of the, um, the ivy rolling. I've done this myself in the center inset there. You see the people pulling back on the ivy. It's really quite amazing how it can roll. So if I sit on top of the ivy and pull it toward me or pull it up from the ground and then cut its stems with a knife, a knife works really well, and then keep pulling it back and rolling it back. It actually helps to have a few people and that's what they're doing in this picture. It just rolls up like a big carpet. Now that's not gonna be the end <clears throat> of ivy, but it definitely gives it a real good kick. And then you can see the ground again and you can see where it's fastened and you can begin to dig out the pieces of it. Let's move on to an another one. English holly, shiny, dark green, glossy, waxy, alternate prickly leaves. Female plants produce white flowers in May followed by red berries that persist into fall and can grow up to 10 meters tall. Prefers full sun, but grows easily in the shade wherever seeds are dispersed by birds. Often found near residential areas along edges of wetlands. It reproduces via seeds and suckers, as you can see in this picture on the top left here, they're growing right off of the roots. Um, it also layers, which I said was um, via touching down on the ground and rooting out at the nodes. And um, you can dig up small plants when it's small um, or when the soil is moist, cut larger plants at the base below the root crown and monitor again for re-sprouting. It re-sprouts very easily. You need to continue cutting this plant back until it dies. And then you can dispose of the berries with the garbage, um, piling up the stems and leaves to dry out or, or rot. And then again, just being aware that it could easily re-sprout and layer. Um, and there's a picture there of the birds eating the berries. So I just wanted to note to you, yes, birds eat the berries. Um, but the berries are toxic to humans. And also just like to mention that I, I learned this from listening to Doug Tallamy, um, who wrote Nature's Best Hope, that birds don't feed berries to their young. They feed insect and insect larvae to their young. So this, this tree, this plant really isn't that helpful. We really need to have native plants because those are the plants that, that the birds evolved with and produce the insects that they can feed to their young. All right, let's look at a garden favorite here. Butterfly bush. This is a plant that was introduced as an ornamental during colonization. It's a deciduous semi evergreen shrub, grows to approximately five meters, which is pretty big has soft medium green leaves and produces these tiny leaves at the axles there where the, where the leaves come out of, they last all winter, has these long spear 
shape flowers. I don't think I need to tell any gardener how to identify a butterfly bush. It prefers sun, but it also grows quite well in shade, thrives on a wide range of soil types, including soils high in sand, nutrient poor, and it's very drought tolerant. It propagates itself very easily by its extremely easy to germinate wind dispersed seeds. And this is the problem with butterfly bush. It's fast growing, escapes gardens, spreads into disturbed, air, into disturbed areas, especially along coastal forest edges, roadsides and on sunny stream banks, where it replaces native plants, producing copious seeds. A single flower can produce over 40,000 seeds, easily germinates from its dispersed seed and low sunny stream edges and river banks. Uh, wood gardener wouldn't want a butterfly bush in their landscape. They're not only attractive to us, they also attract butterflies and hummingbirds that we so dearly want to attract to our gardens. Hybridizers are producing cultivars that are sterile, but we need to do our research before we buy because our best strategy for us to prevent the butterfly bushes already spreading in our gardens from spreading is to deadhead them quickly when they finish. When I talked to the girl at the um, Invasive Species Council about buying butterfly bush cultivars, she was really hesitant for me to recommend anything like that. I thought it might as um, grow me instead. So she said, you know, she just doesn't trust butterfly bush because of if, if its ability to seed. So I'm not sure. We'll have to do our research and make sure if you do buy a butterfly bush it, that it's sterile. Butterfly bush, while it's an excellent source of nectar for adult butterfly bu butterflies, it is not a host plant for any of our native species larva. And we should consider this when choosing our garden plants because our native birds and butterflies need the plants they've evolved with to nurture their young. Um, okay. Here's the one I call bad Daphne, because there are some very nice garden worthy Daphnes you can buy. Here's one you might, uh, sorry, one you might have in your garden that is a very nice Daphne is called Eternal Fragrance. It's about a three foot by three foot little shrub and has very lovely scented flowers. But bad Daphne, I've seen many times in my career growing in people's yards, usually in a forested area. It definitely likes shade. And folks often think that it's some kind of a rhododendron. They're surprised when I tell them it's an invasive. It has oblong, waxy, dark green leaves, as you can see down here on the bottom uh, left, uh, clustered in whorls, very much like a rhododendron. So I think that's why people often think that it is a rhodo. It has small yellow green flowers. And I think you can see them in the middle picture there um, that develop into blue black berries uh, in summer. It grows to approximately one to two meters, but I usually see them as quite small. Uh, its reproduction is mainly via its seed dispersal. And uh, there's this little picture here of, this is a stem of, of the Daphne. Uh, it's an interesting note that it is recognizable by a smooth tan colored bark. <clears throat> I think all Daphne's have it. I, I'm not positive that I've seen all Daphne's, but every Daphne I've seen has that smooth tan colored bark. So Daphne can tolerate a wide range of growing conditions, but it prefers open shade, moist, but well-drained. This is a photo taken of Daphne Lariola on Newcastle Island. And you can see the problem with Daphne seeding itself into an open woodland. Introduced here is a Mediterranean ornamental and it's pest free in our area. So it has no natural enemies. The seeds are dispersed by birds and rodents. This plant's dense growth reduces light to the forest floor and limits the growth of native plants. Over on the right here at the bottom, you can see the root system of Daphne. It is deep rooted, very difficult to remove. Even a young plant that you think you can pull out is actually very deep rooted, very well rooted. You probably won't be able to pull it out unless it's exceptionally small. All plants of all parts of this plant are poisonous to humans and the sap is caustic. This plant is actually listed as noxious in British Columbia. Now we'll move on to the ground covers. They're a very troublesome bunch. So here is periwinkle. 
periwinkle, the I invest, uh, sorry, Invasive Species Council notes is one of the top six most invasive plants that are still being sold at nurseries in our province. So here's the ID on it. It's an evergreen perennial ground cover with long trailing stems. The leaves are very small, shiny, oval and dark green, has very pretty blue flowers in the spring. I always hear gardeners making apologies for periwinkle. Oh, they say it's not invasive in my garden. I would also note that there is a vinca major. It's, a, it's not as common as the, the vinca minor, but also quite aggressive. Uh, this is a picture of it here at the bottom on the left, and it grows a little more upright, as, but it still has rhizomes. Um, very shade tolerant plant, both of them. Also succeeds in sun, grows vigorously in damp areas and on slopes, and spreads easily from original plantings and from garden refuse. Do not try to compost this plant. It needs to go, it needs to be dried out on tarps and then put into the garbage. Just gonna move my slide forward here. There we go. Um, it forms dense mats that suppress and smother many low growing plants, shades out native seedlings, prevents their growth, often invades forested areas and watercourse edges, and it's highly competitive due to its rapid growth and adaptability. So there's a picture here of its trailing stem. And again, you can see what it does is it, node, it, it um, produces roots along its nodes. And those are underground, right? So you can, you have to, when you see the flower, or the plant and you dig it out, there's another piece of it in there. So this is definitely a plant that needs to be monitored continually when you're trying to eradicate it from your garden. The stems root very easily wherever a node touches the ground. And don't forget this plant can also produce viable seeds. So how to prevent and control periwinkle? Well, if you have it growing in your garden, and it's escaped and you know it's going into a ravine or something, focus on that area. Get it out of the natural areas first, such as ravines. Cut it back in the spring because repeated cutting can kill the plant. But again, it must be monitored for resprouting, which will occur. Dig out the roots and continue to monitor. Dispose it after the roots and cuttings have dried. It can also be placed into wet, uh, wetted and placed into black garbage bags to solarize. All right, ready for another one? There's a plant you've probably seen in your garden or someone else's. This is Lamium galeobdolin. I've never heard it called yellow archangel myself, but some people call them dead nettles. Um, it has heart-shaped leaves, very much silver and green variegated. And it's ever, oh, sorry, did I say it was evergreen? It's a trailing ground cover, has square, slightly hairy stems and small upright yellow flowers in spring. Again, a scopia seed producer, but is known to be more successful by its vigorous underground stems, rhizomes. Its habit, habitat is urban landscapes and elsewhere where it's escaped cultivation, including parks, riparian areas and forested areas. It's very shade tolerant, widely adaptable. Very popular in hanging baskets. And you'll notice here in the picture in the top left corner, it often comes to us that way. And I know people just throw this plant out and some people throw plants over the fence uh, when they try to get rid of them. And then this plant has escaped into nature. It's widely available in garden centers, spreads aggressively, smothers everything and depletes soil fertility. It also can grow right over top of other plants. So there's, there's things in there, you don't even know what's in there because there's so much lamium growing. You can remove the flowers before the seeds form, dig it to remove the roots, and then monitor closely for resprouting. Again, this is not a plant that you should ever compost, dry, or let it rot on tarps or solarize in black garbage bags. I'd also like to um, show you just with lamium, there are other varieties of it. And I've seen this one. This is purple flowering lamium. There are cultivars of this plant as well. Um, this particular purple variety, I've seen growing all over a neglected yard and it had a patio, an old patio. And the purple lamium was coming up all through the cracks. It was everywhere. It had traveled everywhere in the yard. So, you know, once in my career, I had bought one called White Nancy. 
it's available in the garden centers and I planted it in my yard. I thought it was kind of cute, but my coworker suggested I might not be glad I did after a while. So I got rid of it. And I'm just not sure if all these forms are as invasive, but potentially they could be. Having seen what I've seen Lamium can do, I just would never grow it. Next, we're gonna look at Agapodium. Um, I call it gout weed, bishop's weed. It's also called ground elder. Um, this is a herbaceous perennial, means it dies to the ground each year and is dormant until spring. The leaves are basal. They're directly attached to the stems without a, without a petiole. Um, you can see the leaf form here. There is actually a green form and a variegated form. Um, and then the, the flowers are produced in umbels, as you can see on the bottom right-hand corner here. So it has quite a pretty flower, but this is a real thug and very, very difficult to get rid of, especially if it's in the green form. It reproduces both by seed and rhizomes, um, although the rhizomes propagate easier than seed because seed requires a sunny location to germinate and goat weed does very well in shade. Just gonna quote here. <clears throat> There's a picture of it blooming. Looks quite innocent, but this is a plant that will run right through everything. It was introduced to North, North America as a garden ornamental during colonization and commonly used as a ground cover, especially the variegated form. This is the green form here. Um, I think I said that about the moist areas. The primary spread of gout weed, according to the Invasive Species Council, is via human activity. They recommend that you don't purchase this plant or any container that has it. Do not let it plant, don't let it succeed in any way in your landscape. It can revert to its green form and it's an unstoppable spreader through every part of your garden, including right through your shrubs. I have seen this like beautiful large rhododendrons, but the agapodium is running right through them. So how are you ever gonna get rid of it? It's in the roots of your, of your beautiful shrub. So the only thing you can do is remove everything Hire an excavator. No, you've got a problem when you've got this plant in your yard. Uh, St. John's wort. This is one I see all over the place, especially in um, commercial sites. So low growing shrubby ground cover can grow up to half a meter high. It has a woody base with multiple thick leafy branch stems, bright yellow flowers, it has tap roots that extend deep in soil and the rhizomes growing laterally are extensive. It likes full sun and moist soil, but because it has those deep roots, it can support resistance to drought. Seeds can produce 30,000 seeds, sorry, flowers. Seed, flowers can produce 30,000 seeds per plant. Known to many as a medicinal plant, it's purported to alleviate depression, insomnia, and anxiety, but it outcompletes native species and it is listed as noxious in some areas. I don't think it is listed on the coastal ISC, so I found that kind of confusing looking at the websites. Um, there, some plants aren't even shown on their website, others are listed. I know that this plant is listed as noxious in California. It contains a toxin that um, causes skin irritation and blistering in light colored livestock. And that's why you see the sheep here with the mask on its face. Sap can also affect humans. Um, Wikipedia says that many hypericum species are regarded as invasive and noxious weeds. This is one that is very difficult to dig out due to its thick and deep rooting. Apparently it can be managed by tilling in agricultural circumstances. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the little bug there that is a beetle uh, biocontrol of this plant called Chrysalina hypericae. Um, but what I read about this beetle that has been used to control this plant is that usually the plant, there's so much of it, you would need <laughs> very many beetles to be able to have any effect on the amount of, of St. John's wort or hypericum that is growing. Uh, here's another one I mentioned at the beginning, chameleon plant, Houtonia. Um, chameleon is this cultivar. So you can see the green form of it there. And it is a fast growing, again, herbaceous, which mean, means it dies down to the ground in winter. 
it grows to 20 centimeters high. That's about eight inches. Um, there's the green form. The chameleon is green, green, pink, and white. Some people really like it. I don't. Um, I can tell you why in a minute. It, it noticed, uh, here's an ID on it too. It has very reddish stems, very insignificant small white flowers in May and June. And that's a term insignificant that horticulturists use as opposite to showy. So very small little flower there. This plant has a very strong aroma. That's why I don't like it. it there's some people call it herby, herby. I call it fishy. Um, it really likes moisture pretty much needs moisture, expands very easily in woodland areas, um, just doesn't do too well in dry areas. So again, I once saw a lady's yard that had chameleon plant growing everywhere. Um, it doesn't form a dense mat like uh, lamium does or like agapodium does, but it just crops up everywhere. You just get so sick of seeing it when <laughs> when you have that much of one plant in your yard. Very discouraging for gardeners. Um, could it be controlled by planting it in a dry site? Possibly, or possibly a contained or concreted site like a garden bed enclosed by stone or concrete border. Again, I just wouldn't trust Houtonia due to its vigorous rhizomes. Once they get underneath the hardscape, they will travel until they find light and then they'll start growing up again because that's what rhizomes do. And there's a picture of the rhizomes um, growing out of the soil. And I, if you've seen Morning Glory uh, rhizomes, does that not remind you of Morning Glory? It's they're kind of thick and fleshy looking. And here's a yard that is just full of hootenia. And actually, that is really a map of it, isn't it? I, I, when I saw it in this lady's yard, maybe because it was a dry, sunny site on a slope in White Rock, and it was just cropped up everywhere. It doesn't stop it from growing. It just looks worse. All right, let's move on. Yellow flag iris. This is another plant that is listed as noxious in British Columbia. Uh, it's a typical looking iris species, except for its height. It grows up to 150 centimeters, which is five feet. That's a very tall iris. Leaves are typical sword shaped <clears throat> up to uh, three feet, 90 centimeters long. This plant needs a lot of moisture. It grows out of control in wet areas, but it looks so pretty in the garden. And here's a picture of it mingling with blue geranium. It can fool you. Due to its love of moisture, it spreads easily through your pond or ditches, uh, shorelines, wetlands, streams, and it can spread itself both by seed and rhizomes. And up here in the top left corner is a picture of the rhizome. Now, that is a giant, that is a giant rhizome. And you can see someone's hand that is holding it. It's very large. It reproduces extremely easy via these rhizomatous roots. And pieces of this plant can easily propagate themselves and form new plants. The seeds can float on water, which enables its spread. It forms thick mats underwater, reducing water flow and crowding out native vegetation. So it's damaging to native plants, damages wildlife native ha habitat and is currently spreading very fast through the Pacific Northwest and the Southern interior. Eradication of this plant is so difficult because it grows in water. It makes it very difficult to remove. And we should also think too that there's, we should never use any chemical controls, especially anywhere near riparian areas. Here's one I'm not sure if you're familiar with. This is called Himalayan balsam impatiens glandulifera. If you recognize the name impatiens, this plant is the same genus as the reliable little annual that we all plant in spring, impatiens walleriana. But impatiens glandulifera is a bad apple in this family. It's also known as policeman's helmet, uh, poor man's orchid, and it has a name touch me not because its seed capsules explode when they're ripe. Easily identifiable once you've seen it, the branches and stems are hollow. They resemble bamboo, but they're very easily broken. Definitely not sturdy like bamboo. There's a picture of the stem down here on the left side. 
And you can see that it's green with kind of pinkish tinge at the nodes. The leaves are serrated, red veined and fleshy. Flowers are usually purpley pink. And this plant pulls out of the ground very easily. See, this is an upside down picture, this one right here of the plant as you pull it out. It's a, you can pull it out easily. You might as well do it, but don't do it when it has seed heads on it. I'm just gonna show you a picture of that here. So let's see, I'm on slide 33. Um, I'll just advance that. So this is what the seed heads look when they're fresh. And this is what they look like when they're ripe and ready to explode. Um, it, as mentioned, it likes nutrient rich, moist, natural areas, and it's tolerant of shade. What it is intolerant of is dry conditions. Where I lived in Langley, I saw Langley parks just run through this, run through by this plant. It was shocking to see because I knew what it was. Once these plants get ahead of you, it's very difficult to take control, even for the municipalities that have limited budgets to deal with these problems. Uh, sorry, I'm just one behind there. Okay, let's look at another noxious plant here. This is Japanese knotweed. It's causing a lot of problems. Um, it's another herbaceous perennial. Honestly, for the size of the plant, it's amazing. It dies right down to the ground at the end of the season. Apparently, it was introduced as an ornamental for its rapid growth and attractive appearance. Four species are now established in BC, the Bohemian, the Giant, the Himalayan, and the Japanese knotweed. Stems are hollow like a bamboo, so it's kind of like the um, uh, Impatience glandulifera in that regard. You can see in this inset down here on the, on the left-hand side, and it has a very bamboo looking stem, um, but it is a lot sturdier than, than the um, impatient glandulifera. And this, these stems are smooth and purpley green colored, about two and a half centimeters in diameter, so about an inch. The leaves are heart shaped, medium green. Big creamy white blooms in August. I guess that's what someone thought was attractive about it such as you see in the picture. And I think if you look at the leaf form here, this is a good ID for it too, because you see how the leaf, the stem kind of zigzags along like that. People don't know they have this plant in their yard. They think it's just a shrub. And they're very surprised to learn that they have Japanese knotweed. It can grow a foot per week during the growing season. It definitely likes moist environments lives in temperate rainforests where it comes from in Southeast Asia, but it can tolerate many environments, including high heat, shade, even drought, but mostly it thrives along creeks, rivers, and lake shores. And although it is a copious seed producer, it is the aggressive rhizome. Oh, I'm gonna click forward here just a moment. There we go. The aggressive rhizome that um, makes this plant really a problem. So you can see in the picture, this person's hand is actually on a rhizome. That's, that's a rhizome, that's an underground stem of this plant that is reproducing more plants. Uh, it's considered to be one of the most invasive exotic species once established. It is extremely difficult to eradicate. It has very aggressive rhizomous root system, bamboo life, but more aggressive. And it can even cause damage to concrete foundations and buildings here. You can see it growing out of asphalt. It grows through concrete, grows through asphalt. A very extensive deep-rooted rhizomes, um, significant and viable seed production. Any small fragment can reproduce vegetatively. Big, big leaves easily shade out other plants. Infestations dominate riparian area areas where they degrade habitat decrease the biodiversity, and it has very little value to wildlife. Knotweed has even been implicated in court cases, citing loss of value to property due to destruction of infrastructure. I think we're doing pretty good time-wise, so I'm just gonna continue here. I thought you might be interested just to look at a few more troublesome plants. So these are um, ones I didn't include. They're the honorable mentions, I guess, or dishonorable. Um, the first group here propagate themselves very easily by seed. Um, many gardeners like them and then might learn to regret them. So here at the top, we have bachelor buttons, the Centauri or Cyanus, 
It gets around by its copious seeds, still a very pretty plant, easy to remove and often forgiven for its seed seediness. It's a popular one in seed mixes. Here in the middle is Rose Campion, uh, Lychnis cornaria, another seedy one, but pretty in bloom, um, but not long before it's cropping up everywhere. And there's California poppy over here on the right at the top, Schultzia. It goes to seed very quickly. And next thing you know, it's everywhere in your garden. It's also very popular in seed mixes. And then down here on the bottom left, Columbine. So Aquilegia is a very popular garden plant. We like it, but I can tell a garden who's a little neglected when there's columbine growing everywhere. Um, we have a, a native columbine that is not seedy, but this one, um, Aquilegia vulgaris, is non-native, non and it is a very uh, prolific seed producer. Uh, and these are the troublesome plants that uh, <clears throat> get around underground by a rhizom. So you've probably tried some of these or bought plants that had baskets of some of these plants. And here's a cute little one called Creeping Jenny, Lismachia nummularia. Um, there are other Lismachias as well that are tall growing uh, called Lustrice and uh, they can take over parts of your garden very quickly. So this is quite an invasive plant um, that often comes in a basket. And then there's this one here on the right called Mrs. Rob's Bonnet, it's a euphorbia. And um, euphorbias are also known as spurges, very popular garden plants with some very nice varieties too. There's just a few bad apples in this family. I should mention in case you're not aware that they have a white sap that can burn your skin. So you should always wear gloves when handling euphorbias. You only have to cut it to see the white sap oozing out of it. And not just to be, it's just to be, not be confusing, sorry, because common names can be very confusing. Here is one that is commonly called Japanese spurge. It's not in the Euphorbia genus. So that's this one down here on the bottom left. This is Pachysandra. And I think most folks just know it as Pachysandra. Uh, it's a very dense uh, plant I see, or dense growing plant. I see people using it up against buildings and things like that. And, and it was even once I saw in an older grow me instead offered as an alternative, but I'd be very nervous about planting Pachysandra if you thought you were gonna remove it because it has a very, very um, deep rooted system. And so lastly, here's the one called Snow in Summer, which I think is a lovely name. Um, it even looks nice in a fresh little pot to buy at the nursery, but it will soon run over everything and anything in your garden that gets in its way. And by midsummer, it can look pretty rough. So I recommend just saying no, Snow in Summer. So what to do about invasives? They are everyone's problem. First of all, know what you grow. Learn about the invasive plants in your area. Be wary of plants labeled fast spreader or vigorous self-seeder. Consider the potential for invasiveness of any rhizomatous plant. Don't dig plants from roadsides, gravel pits, or other disturbed areas to bring home and plant in your own landscape. Deadhead, known self-seeders to prevent further dispersal of their seeds by birds and other wildlife. This will help for plants such as we discussed and also Himalayan blackberry. In fact, for blackberry, if you're not going to remove it, my advice is to get out the hedge trimmer and cut it back as soon as the berries finish. Don't let it go to seed. Just say no. Beware of gifts from well-meaning friends. Don't accept unknown plants from other people's gardens. They're usually given away for a reason. These plants overproduce. Be especially suspicious of anything called a ground cover. Anything rhizomatous is going to spread and most ground covers spread by rhizomes. Some plants spread nicely, slowly that is, but others are known to be vigorous and problematic, even downright invasive as we've seen here. Beware of seed packets, such as those labeled wildflower mix. A university study in Washington discovered that 19 different packets of wildflower mixes contain from three to 13 invasive plant species. I have had written to West Coast Seeds to ask them about their catalog because we all buy from the West Coast Seed catalog or pour over it. And um, I got a letter back from a fellow there and he told me that uh, on their seed packets, they don't 
name all the seed, the plants that are in the seed packet, but on their bigger packets called sprinkle bags, they have room for, so they do list them. He was kind of a protective about butter, uh, not butterfly bush, sorry, um, bachelor buttons. He said, you know, in his garden, he liked that plant. He didn't think it was very problematic, very easy to remove. And I would agree with him. That's one thing about bachelor buttons is it's not difficult. It's not uh, difficult to remove because it's not deep rooted and it's not rise because it's just a seedy plant. So use the Grow Me Instead books or try the Great Plant Picks website. Uh, the, the Grow Me Instead is the initiative of the uh, Invasive Species Council, as I mentioned. And you can download all this information. And I'm going to I'm going to show you some of their choices here. And I also wanted to mention uh, the Great Plant Picks website. So it's greatplantpicks.org. It's on your handout, and they just have fabulous lists of plants for every situation. Uh, they're in in uh, located in Seattle. Uh, they're funded by a botanical garden there. And um, they're, they often produce those great posters that you see in garden centers that are all bold um, colors or plants for shade. Um, you can also put in the name of a plant and then it will bring up a whole list of plants that they have with that genus. Or you can also search by common names. So I really encourage you to try it. It's greatplantpicks.org. So we've got a few minutes to look at some Grow Me instead. So let's look at shrubs for sun. These are suggestions that are provided in the Grow Me Instead booklet. So our own native Nootka Rose over here on the left at the top, um, and then uh, Salmonberry, also a native, even Blueberry, I think. I lived in Cloverdale for 15 years and there are fields of Blueberry there. And in the fall, the blueberries are a gorgeous red color. They make a nice plant and you can either eat the blueberries yourself or let the birds have them. They're very tasty. Um, there's the hollies. So we don't, there's better plants than English holly. So these are called the Meserve hollies. And this one is called Blue Princess. It kind of has a bluish leaf. Uh, you know, it's not a, uh, sorry, it, um, I thought I had the size of it there, but I think they grow about the same size as uh, the English holly. And there are quite a few different varieties. So more than just Blue Princess. And then this one here in the middle at the bottom is Holly Osmanthus. So it's not a true holly. Uh, holly is Ilex, um, Osmanthus is Osmanthus, uh, but it has holly-like leaves, very, very holly-like leaves. And it grows fairly large. There is also a dwarf variety called Goshiki and it can take some shade. And then also our Oregon grape, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this plant, um, Mahonia. And I should mention, you know, that there are two different species. We have one called uh, Nervosa that grows on the ground, very low growing. And then there's um, the Mahonia aquifolium, which is the tall growing. I've got some more shrubs for sun. Let's consider red elderberry. I love this red elderberry. I think it's a great plant, um, very open. I love seeing the white flowers on it in the spring and the red berries in the fall. Of course, being a native, it's good food for our, for our native uh, fauna. Um, it's a very large plant actually. And then in the middle here is our own uh, native mock orange, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's Louisii. And um, it's a twiggy deciduous shrub. Uh, produces clusters of very fragrant white flowers in June and grows again very tall. Flowers are attractive to butterflies. It grows well in partial shade. It's tolerant of dry and wet so soils and it has a graceful arching habit that looks great in the shrub border. Uh, I have the ribs here somewhere but I'm going to go down to this bottom one here. So I just wanted to show you this Mexican mock orange. So this is the confusion with common names. This is a completely different plant. It's not Philadelphus, as you can see. It's called Choicea ternata. And this cultivar is called Sundance um, because it has the yellowy leaves. So the, the Choicea ternata, that is not the cultivar, the species plant has more of a medium green leaf, but this is an evergreen. Um, and uh, it grows probably, I think they get quite large if they like their spot. They can probably grow as wide, as tall, at least I'm gonna say, five feet by five feet easily. 
And uh, there's a picture in the middle there of the little Daphne that I mentioned was a good Daphne called Daphne Transatlantica Eternal Fragrance. There's several other cultivars of this plant, and it's a very nice little Daphne that grows about three feet by three feet. Another choice um, could be the black chokeberry, uh, uh, Aronia. So I've seen this plant used as hedging. Yeah, this is a non-native, but it has a very nice fall color, as you can see by the leaf inset here. And it produces a black berry uh, later in the fall. I've actually seen this plant being used in hedging. And then here at the top is our flowering winter currant, a native again. I think everyone wants to have at least one of these in their garden. It's so pretty and one of the first ones to flower in the spring. Uh, I've got some shrubs for shade. So grow me instead, shrubs for shade. Pacific rhododendron, that's a nice plant. Can grow up to two meters and it's adapted to our south coastal conditions. Has pink flowers, evergreen leaves, blooms in the shade. Did you know it was the state flower of Washington? Japanese skimia, also evergreen, one of my favorite little shrubs. White flowers in spring, followed by big red berries in the female plants. It likes woodland conditions. Evergreen huckleberry, I'm sorry, this is not a great picture, but maybe you're already familiar with this plant. It's a native, grows up to two meters, which is quite a large plant. It's evergreen, has pretty burn shaped flowers that are pink and tasty edible fruits. This was used by indigenous people. Um, and uh, the inset of its blueberries is right there at the top, tasty blueberries. Hydrangea, who, who can live without a hydrangea or two in their garden? There's many dwarfs available. They like shade. Um, there are the macrophyllas that have these big round flowers and there are the paniculatas that have the cone shaped flowers. So many to choose from. And then finally, this picture over here at the bottom on the right, this is called goat's beard or aruncus. And I really like them. There's dwarfs of this plant too. Again, guess what? It's completely herbaceous. So it dies down to the ground at the end of the year. It comes back every year. Some people think of it as a giant of still wheat. Isn't that what it looks like? Okay, how about a few ground covers? Well, we got a few minutes left here. I'm going pretty fast now. So. There we go. Okay, so uh, if the area is sunny, uh, there are many varieties of stone crop or the sedums. I love sedums. So many nice ones, tall ones, small ones, ground cover ones. Most are late blooming with yellow or pink flowers. They love sun and are drought tolerant. The ground cover varieties spread nicely, not aggressively, just nicely. And they're very easy to transplant or remove if you want to. We actually have a BC native called Broadleaf stone crop. There it is there. Um, it has evergreen waxy grayish succulent leaves and yellow flowers. And you might have bought this plant at your nursery in a cultivar called Capo Blanco. Um, and I like Capo Blanco, but I do notice it roots quite easily and tries to grow, but it scrapes out also very easily if you don't want it somewhere. One of my favorite sedums is the Chemscaticum stone crop, glossy green leaves and bright yellow flowers. And there's even variegated varieties of stone crop over here on the right. As you can see, this one produces a pink flower and it has variegated white and green leaves. And then we'll also just mention, here's a native, not a sedum. This is Kinnikinnik, Arctostaphylus. It's a native here and a very pretty ground cover. It likes some moisture, doesn't do well in dry soil. Best in a sunny location, but not too dry. I got some ground covers for shade here. All right. Salal, a well-known durable native. Green leaves, low growing, adapted to dappled light, not full sun, very successful in the right conditions. Unfortunately, I've seen it so many times used in the wrong conditions, often on commercial sites. I think where they are specifying, the architects are specified to have to have maybe, you know, 20% native plants. So they choose Salal and poor Salal is, uh, you know, surrounded by concrete and dry soil that nobody's watering and in full sun, and it looks really bad. Uh, False Lily of the Valley uh, is a native. It's a deciduous uh, ground cover with glossy heart-shaped leaves and tiny star-shaped white flowers. It likes moisture and woodland conditions. We got hookahra, which is the commonly called alum root. This one is a BC native. 
It's evergreen, clumping, as opposed to running, likes moisture, well-drained soil, and even grows around rocks. Then there's sweet woodruff. This is one I love for a ground cover in my garden. It comes up early in the year. I consider it an ephemeral because it uh, thrives in the early part of the season while it's moist and then it dries out, dies out, uh, and becomes dormant again as summer approaches. Uh, Western wild ginger here in the middle uh, is, a, is an evergreen with leaves that have spicy fragrance when they're crushed. It grows as an understory plant in our forests and it actually tolerates dry shade. And then over here, I'm just gonna just love the epimediums and there's so many of these too. This is epimedium rubrum, um, has small rosy flowers in spring. Epimediums take shade very well. They do best in light shade or dappled shade. And they're one of the plants that we can recommend for dry shade, which would be like under conifers. Um, and Great Plant Picks has 29 epimediums, so I think they like them too. This is a plant that's very well regarded in horticultural circles. Lots of cultivars, flowers in white, pink, and yellow, and many attractive leaf forms. Spreads nicely mounding more than spreading. And lastly, let's look at some irises, anything to replace iris pseudocorus. All right, we've got Japanese iris, iris insada. It's a pond margin plant, grows to a meter high, beautiful yellow centers on these purple flowers, or half, I think those yellow centers are called. The Western blue iris, um, smaller growing than the Japanese iris, but it can grow in water. It's also known as Rocky Mountain iris. And then the Oregon iris, iris tenax. This one is lavender in color, has gorgeous markings on flowers. It likes moist but well-drained soil. And then there's the Japanese water iris. This one uh, grows large actually with showy flowers. There's some different colors available in this plant, uh, purple, pink, blue. It grows to about a meter high. And then this is butter and sugar. It's an iris siberica. That does sound good, doesn't it? Butter and sugar it grows to about 75 centimeters, which is larger than two feet. It likes humus rich soil and it is drought tolerant. I think that's the end. So if you have questions and maybe we can find some answers for you. That was excellent. Thank you, Jacqueline. I want to read you the first comment that I got from LD. Excellent presentation. So wonderful and good timing. We've got some questions and comments here. All right. Um, are there any okay varieties of St. John's wort to grow? For instance, Albury purple. Have you heard of that one? No, it's a cultivar, obviously. Um, so that would be Hypericum alberry purple. If anyone else has uh, information on that, it's not one that I have seen. I would be, you know, careful with the Hypericum. Uh, I think I mentioned it, uh, when we were discussing that slide that um, it is one that can be quite aggressive via its very, very thick roots. So you're not going to get that plant out easily once it's established. So I would just caution the person who is asking about that to find out if anyone else has grown it, maybe ask at the counter at the nursery that's selling it if they know anything about it. I mean, they're selling plants because they wanna sell plants, but um, we don't wanna put things in our garden that we're going to regret. So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you that there. Does anyone else that is at the meeting here know anything about that cultivar? Yes, go ahead and put it in the chat if you have any other ideas. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and we'll go on to another question. Uh, Dorothy would like to know more about solarizing. Can you define that a bit and, and how to do it? All right. So I read about it on the Invasive Species Council website. I think um, it would probably work very well and be faster than just putting a plant on tarps to let it dry out and die. But if you solarize, so solarizing is often like tarping an area of unwanted plants in your yard somewhere that you're trying to kill off vegetation. So it will really heat up under black plastic and you've already um, pulled it out, I think. So, you know, you're, all, you're gonna wet it and you're gonna cut it and you're gonna, and you're trying to do this so that you know that it's dead and gone before you put it in the garbage. 
Yes, essentially what you're doing is uh, you're cooking it. Mm-hmm. And that's why, that's why uh, um, your suggestion of um, putting it in the black plastic bags because it's easy to handle when it's dry, you add a bit of water, you tie it in the bag, uh, it cooks, and then you take it out uh, um, with the other garden waste. Okay, excellent. And that answers Elisa's question of, of where and how to get rid of the butterfly bush flowers. So same thing, that's the best way. Yeah, so I would agree with butterfly bush flowers, you know, that is a very viable seed. So if you're just going to uh, throw it in the garbage, for all you know, it's going to get dispersed somehow by a bird. Um, So you definitely want to solarize it. Okay, great. Um, Another audience member has a question about horsetail, how to get rid of horsetail. (laughs) Wouldn't we all like to know? (laughs) I don't think we're ever going to get rid of horsetail. It will always be with us. So, you know, uh, you can pull it. Um, It actually comes out quite easily, but you're not going to find those rhizomes. They are so, so tiny and they run very deeply. That's a plant that has been around since the dinosaurs. Oh, wow. Well, interesting. Well, and- also, also one of the ways that you can control it <laughs> is that it's dioecious, which means the um, male and the female plants look different. And the uh, female plant comes up first. She's that, that pretty frondy little gal. And then the males come up all big and strong and straight. And those are the ones that you cut off at the ground level. And although it may spread um, by its rhizomes, I found that it really, really slowed it down because it didn't have the males to help propagate it. And um, I found it a surprisingly um, good control, but that was just my garden. And I have found other people um, have to struggle a lot more with it. Right. So, Joe, I think you're talking about when it produces that that spore producing plant. It actually when I was a little girl, I, I they reminded me of snakes because they're they're like half an inch thick and they grow like a foot tall and they kind of got rings around them. Something yes. about that. It kind of scared me. I just thought it was a creepy plant because the pretty <laughs> ones, the girls, like you say, they, they look kind of fluffy and nice. It's just that, you know, it's a plant you can't control. It's just going to come up wherever it feels like it. Right. But you're right. There's a spore producing part of that plant, the male, I guess. And um, it, it definitely has a completely different look to it. So that's when you might want to Google and, and see what you're looking at there. Yeah, exactly. And and um, um, I was also taught um, that anytime you cut down a producing plant, you're robbing it of nutrients. And that's a green plant. And so when you cut it down, male or, or female, um, you're really uh, doing some damage to it. And that's a good control. Okay. Gives it a kick. Yeah, you <laughs> bet. That makes sense. Good. Um, another question that just came in, um, a recommendation for a ground cover for a really large area. So a really rapid growing one and definitely drought tolerant. A suggestion about turf <laughs> <laughs> that's not drought tolerant is it <laughs> actually there actually are pretty form, <laughs> there are several forms of turf that can be quite ground uh, um, drought tolerant and will remain green um, clover is one of them oh yes i agree i really like clover as a ground cover it stays short it spreads it does stay green doesn't it it sure does, and you can Google you can Google um, non-invasive um, clovers, and there are several varieties. And I believe West Coast Seeds sells micro clover. Yeah, I was going to mention West Coast Seeds there, so that's a that's a great source. You can look them up online, or they have a great catalog, what most of us have, and um, they have all kinds of alternatives. So maybe look for something there. I, I you know any of the ground covers that we talked about today. I certainly wouldn't want to see them growing over a large area because most of them are just rhizomatous plants that are, you know, they escape and they're going to go wherever they want to go. Um, they're, you're, if you have a ravine nearby or a meadow, you know, you're going to have a problem with that plant. 
Okay, right. And then someone's just commenting, uh, be careful of the, because clover tracks bees so well, and then if you have children running around on it. So that's a little bit of a caution. Yeah, that's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Because I, you know, I, I know that people are, are, you know, they want, they like the idea of clover, but because clover has a bloom and attracts the bees, then you've got kids running around in the grass and stepping on the bees. So And, and, and children can be taught <laughs> I grew up on, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I understand. And I also understand that some children have anaphylactic responses. And, and that's pretty hard to live with for not only the parent, but the kid. But I grew up on a clover lawn and I was taught to watch for the bees because if um, there were bees and me on the lawn, and I was four years old, is one of the first things I was taught. Guess what? The bees ace the kids because the bees pollinate things. So um, yeah, they can be taught. And one thing you'll find is that um, there's um, the only bee, wild bee that uh, has um, a stinger is our bumblebee and they are extremely docile. And the majority of our wild bees do not sting. And um, the, the stinging bee is the um, hive bee. The European hive bee, the honeybee. So, um, you know, you got to live with some stuff, guys. <laughs> That's right. Wear and wear shoes, right? You know, wear <laughs> shoes. Oh God, I hate wearing shoes. <laughs> oh, I do too. But yeah, I've stepped on enough hornets to learn. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, now, someone suggests as a ground cover alfalfa. Do you sure, know? if you got a big field, I guess you could. Yeah, it would grow pretty tall, though, wouldn't it? Bow it down and sell it, too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I've seen that in my neighborhood. Um, and someone's asking about, oh, neighbors with large patches of blackberry plants getting out of control. What can I do? I, I think you mentioned cutting off the tips. And just... Well, at least you could at least you can, you know, cut it down after it's finished producing its berries. If I, I live in an area here in Lake Cowichan, it, I, there's so much blackberry around here, it almost outcompetes the Scotch broom. Um, it just, it, it, to me, it's not even an attractive plant, but I keep hearing people making, you know, apologies for it because it's free food or tasty fruits. So really it somehow gets to redeem itself. I, I guess I would also say it does provide cover for bunnies and, you know, small critters in there, but, um, is she wondering how to get rid of it when it's on a neighbor's property? Yes. That's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I guess all you can do is cut it back to your property line. Well, that's right. I mean, we can cut back to our property line. You know, it does, it does root at the tip. So I, you know, I, I just whack it back. I just keep cutting it back. So go with loppers, cut it down. It dries out very quickly. Um, ideally, uh, you could uh, tackle it in the winter, it was my suggestion. You know, that's when it is not actively growing, you'll see a lot less of it, you'll be able to see where the crowns are. As far as it being on somebody else's property, you know, it's just really sad, isn't it? Because it goes under the fence, it comes over the fence. We all are dealing with blackberry. Yes, and we all see a lot of scotch broom around too. And we have several questions about do you have any ideas for getting rid of that? Same thing, I guess. Chocolate. There is so much information online because Scotch broom is, has become such a problem, especially here on Vancouver Island. It's on the mainland too, but I never saw it like anything like over here. And right. again, people make apologies for it. I, I had a contractor here and I was complaining about the Scotch broom and he said, well, I rather like it. It's a touch of color. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, beautiful know. when it flowers but oh, it's everywhere here and, well here's an interesting it, fact about uh, scotch broom is that if you notice every part of it that's not yellow when it's blooming is green so what green tells you is that it's photosynthetic so it is so photosynthesizing right through winter right deciduous plants the, generally aren't doing that I think one of the best examples of controlling a very, very bad noxious weed comes right in the uh, Nanaimo area where they have the remnants of Gary Oak Meadows and whatnot. And along the Nanaimo Parkway there, I remember 20 years ago, that was a complete, complete forest of broom. And you have relatively little in comparison now. And that's because the municipality and the district 
goes out and attacks the broom when it's at its most vulnerable. And that's when it's blooming. And they go out there, gosh, I didn't want to be in that kind of sun with those guys, hacking it all down and carting it away. And yes, it takes uh, years to do, but we have so much less of it because of the diligence of, um, of our municipal workers. And um, then um, they replanted other things that came up and began to compete with the broom. And um, any of us oldsters um, remember what it used to look like. So even something so noxious as broom, um, you just have to be meaner and tougher and live longer. But yeah, one thing also to note about Scotch broom is that it is shade intolerant. If you look oh, at where it's right. growing, it grows oh, in yeah. full sun. I forgot. Yes, yeah, so thank you So if you could that. shade it out. Shade it out. Yeah and cut it before it goes to seed. You've seen what the seed heads look like. I mean, it, it lupin has nothing <laughs> compared to Scotch broom. Oh, wonderful. Well, somebody just made a similar comment about blackberries. They said they heard if after removing the larger stems, if you just keep mowing it and mowing it and mowing it, eventually it, it, it goes, I guess. Yeah, you notice where it grows along uh, ditches, for instance, and then there's a field, it's not growing in the grass because the grass is being cut. So it does, it just doesn't get a chance to, to, to take off there, right? So it has, it's held back by that. But where it gets to expand, it will just leapfrog all over the place. Oh, right, okay. Uh, somebody has a question about yellow weedy buttercup. Ah. Oh. <laughs> ah. Don't we hate buttercup? <laughs> well, that's the one I call weed, right? <laughs> They're not selling that one at the nursery, at least. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, so buttercup is, is you know, I find it pretty easy to remove. As a, as a you know, landscape gardener, I, I w I've removed a ton of buttercup. So I guess I, I like a small flat shovel that I can just slide sideways underneath it and give it a little pry. And then I have my other hand on top of that rosette and it's up and out. Okay. Yeah. The, other thing, the, other thing, up yeah, the other thing about the about the creeping buttercup is that um, it likes that boggy sour soil. Oh yes. And so you can change the growing conditions just as you as as you uh, uh, taught us, Jacqueline. Um, and you create a condition it doesn't like. And there's two ways to do that with creeping buttercup. You take that intermittent boggy soil area. And you turn it into a rain garden where you can conserve the water and um, feed other plants uh, seasonally. Uh, and you can also um, raise that area up where it drains. So you kind of have to know what your landscape is doing. But I've, I've used both your um, system, Jacqueline, of just, just slide and hack and pull. Um, but I've also successfully used those other two, changing the, uh, changing the uh, growing environment to eradicate it. Yeah, it definitely is a plant that prefers shade and moisture. Okay. It tells you something. <laughs> yeah. so taking away that preferable habitat will help. Mm -hmm. Okay, a few comments and questions about why nurseries continue to sell invasive plants and is there any legislation around it and why do they keep doing it? Yeah, because demand, I guess, and, and I, I, honestly, it, it frustrates me too that I saw when well, I was a member of the BC Landscape and Nursery Association for many years and, you know, I thought, you know, why don't they tell the growers to stop growing these plants so that the nurseries are buying these plants so that they're being sold to the public? Why not just go right to the source and, and stop it? Instead, they have a program that is like uh, plant wise. And so, you know, it's have, have a tag hanging off a plant that tells you that it's a good plant to buy when it's right beside, you know, something with lamium in it. Well, people people are attracted to what they're attracted to. And if it's there at the nursery and you can buy it, or it's a, just a piece of it that's in a, a basket, you think, well, that's no problem. You know, people are always saying it's not invasive for me. Well, that's, you know, it, we're making excuses for things, but oh, I totally agree with that. I really wish that we could have better legislation and stop growing these plants. Like I mentioned about the periwinkle, it is one of the most invasive, the top six invasive still being sold in nurseries. Oh, 
they're not selling Scotch broom or Himalayan blackberry, right? You know, we all know what those are, but why are we still selling things like periwinkle? I don't know. Yes, but, and a little bit off topic, but I, periwinkle is sold in a lot of the nurseries in the Okanagan where I'm from, but so is it maybe not invasive there? I, it doesn't yeah, because it does, um, it does really, really well in shade and forested areas, ravines, right? right? Maybe it's more open and, and hot and sunny that it yeah. doesn't prefer there. So like I said, when we were talking about what makes a plant invasive, sometimes a plant can be invasive in certain conditions and just can't grow in others. Some are better generalists than others. And, and that really is often, don't, don't you think, Jacqueline, the, the key to the why are they being sold is that um, uh, they're not invasive in all regions of BC and look at the, look, we have like six different climates in our, in our province. Um, and whereas on the prairies, you have like two. Uh, and so there are people moving around and they say, oh, well, that was a beautiful, lovely plant in, in my garden, you know, in, in Alberta. Uh, right. And, and also so many of the garden centers um are um, are large corporations and they're doing mass buying. That's right, and they're now, back east. Uh, exactly, right? and, yeah. and so these plants are being shipped out from areas that in which they are not necessarily invasive. Right. And um, ethics aside, um, that is often the reality of it. And the people that work in the garden centers aren't always knowledgeable. They're not necessarily experts in anything other than retail. But we do have many good local uh, garden centers that really pride themselves on knowing what plants will work in, in, in our area. So you have a bit of both. It is a case of education. <clears throat> Got to just keep at it. Yeah, and I am noticing more nurseries here will have a, a little native plant section. I'm, uh, Dinters especially had a little native plant section and someone commented that they wished nurseries would sell more of them. But I don't know about you two, Joanne, Jacqueline, um, are you seeing that more and more, more native plants being sold? I think there's quite a trend towards native plants. And I think one of the most important things I learned, as I mentioned, you know, about Dr. Ptolemy, um, bringing nature home is that it's our native plants, our native flora that supports our native fauna. And, you know, that supports the bug life and the, the larva that the birds need to feed to their young. If they don't have the native plants that support those, those bugs that produce that larva, then they may abandon their nest. They may lay the eggs. And if there's no food for them, they can't feed them berries. They don't shove berries down their baby's throats. They, they feed them bugs and they need those bugs that come from the plants and the insects that we all, they all evolved with. That's so a real have some native plants, something for every season in your garden. And yeah. dry for 25%. Aren't, aren't, we, uh, aren't we really uh, lucky in this area? Um, all, all those plants that you showed us, that the Gromi instead plants, the, the high percentage of natives uh, that are so beautiful yeah. uh, that there's no reason not to grow them. And we do have more and more um, native sections in the, in the garden centers, as well as what, what is it, Jacqueline? We have what, three just in the central area of, of Nanaimo that offers native plants? I oh, know, uh, no, uh, I don't know that, Joe. I'm sorry, I'm the lower, <laughs> lower mainlander. Well, I know Dorothy, Dorothy Kaiser just did a wonderful uh, seminar uh, and she, in her yeah. seminar, which is on the Vimga um, uh, YouTube, um, she lists all the um, native uh, plant nurseries. So if someone is interested, as they were saying, where can I get them? Um, just go to that seminar. 